What's good, my dear language learning masters? Welcome to Natural Languages and specifically to a new interview of the Language Input Podcast. And today I'm going to have Sabrina on the show and she's from France, but she's been living in the US for, for quite a while and she's a French teacher there in Denver, Colorado. And today we're going to talk about language teaching a lot. We're going to talk about what teachers really need to do in order to truly help their students, which is what this is all about in the end, right? And we'll talk about ideas for language learning as well, about her, her last project in which she's, she's uh, creating stories and podcasts to, to, to teach French online and, and much more. So yeah, hope you enjoy it and yeah, let's get right into it. Let's go. Okay, so hi Sabrina and hi, hi, hi Alvaro. Nice to see you. <laughs> yeah, it's been it's been a while. Right? It has been. It has been. I don't remember last time. I mean, we we met in Ajan, but I don't. And obviously, we've met several years, but I don't remember last time. <laughs> yeah, it probably was twenty sixteen and twenty seventeen. Okay. Okay, so those were. The last ones before COVID, yes. Okay. Yeah, because I, I didn't go like the, the next two two versions. I mean, the next two years, I didn't go. So yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, w welcome to the podcast. First of all, it's a uh, well, pleasure. For me. And yeah, as usual, let's let's start by you know just tell us a little bit about yourself especially when it comes to, you know, your experience as a teacher and a language learner as well? So I never really, I never thought I would become a teacher. Honestly, that was not in my plan. Okay. Um, but I was always, since very early age, languages were something that I was fascinated by, attracted to. Uh, so I took English, you know, I, I'm French. I was born, raised, educated in Paris. And uh, so, you know, in Europe, we, we take more than one languages. It's very common. Um, but for me, I took like three. I took English, then I took Russian, I took Italian. Mm -hmm. I was just like, that was my thing, you know? Um, so I was always attracted to languages, always, always, always and raised by a Spanish speaking nanny. So okay. nice. languages were always something in part of my life. And um, so I moved to the United States in my 20s and um, I started working. I started working for an airline and stayed with the airline for a decade, a good decade. And uh, then I lost my job and I didn't know what to do. And when I was working for the airlines, I was always training people, so a little bit of teaching there. Okay. And people always told me, God, you would be such a great teacher. You're so patient. <laughs> you really have the thing that, you know, teachers should have. But, you know, I just like, oh, thank you, whatever, you know. And then when I lost my job, I just had to really think, oh, my God, what am I going to do now? So I went back to school here in the States. Uh, even though I had a degree from France, I, you know, they didn't accept a lot of the credit. So I went back to school be, and uh, decided to become a teacher, went for my master's in secondary education and was very, very, very lucky that my methodology teacher, first day, first class, asked us to read Krashen, mm -hmm. <laughs> Stephen Krashen. Amazing. So I was so fortunate that, uh, you know, I had to read The Natural Approach. And, um, and then, you know, when you become a teacher in the United States, you have to do observations. So I observed, and, and so many, you have, I think like 40 hours or 20 hours, I can't remember, but a lot. So I, I was able to observe a lot of teachers and in the United States, you know, that was back in 2006, okay. you know, um, the way that 
I teach, you know, uh, which is acquisition driven way, you know, we go for acquisition, we go for communication was not very common, if you will. Mm -hmm. But I was very lucky to observe a few teachers that were doing stories and uh, that totally resonated with me. So I started, I was hired. Uh, so my methodology teacher spoke about me to this one guy who worked in a school in Naperville, Illinois. And I was hired there because I was so enthusiastic, if you will. I was so happy to want to teach, you know, a different way than I had been taught, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was a journey, an experience, Alvaro. <laughs> so I was hired there. And that's, that high school in Naperville, Illinois, had about 20 teachers. So many different languages were taught in that high school. Latin, Russian, German, French, Spanish. I mean, the, you name it, all languages were there. The mm -hmm. big, big department, like 20 teachers and the, the, the head, the, the guy, the head was Spanish and he taught CI, comprehensible, using comprehensible input. He was doing stories and that's why he hired me because I wanted mm -hmm. to do that too. Right. Unfortunately, unfortunately, there were only three of us doing that. The rest of the department was very, very against this. And uh, it was a terrible year for me, even though I was doing stories, you know, I was, and, and this was my first year, so I was doing it very badly, you know, but, but the kids were absorbing, they were acquiring nonetheless, because right. even though you're not skilled, you're still communicating, you're still, engaging the students yeah. uh but the one teacher the french teacher that was you know the head of the french department was very opposed to that and you know as a matter of fact she was very angry at me because i asked this spanish teacher who was also teaching like i did there were three of us uh, to be my mentor oh and she was mad <laughs> and I will, I will always remember this story. I tell this story a lot because, you know, you know me, I present. And when I, I recall these experiences in that school and other schools that really made, made me realize how difficult my journey was going to be. But this is the one story that I tell. So we were sharing classrooms and uh, she was teaching first period. Then I would Oh, uh, then I would come second mm. and then would come third. So one day, so I'm, I, after I'm done teaching all the students leave the classroom, she comes in because she needs the classroom for the third period and she sees a word. And I don't remember what that word was, but that was a word I used for the story I was doing. She looks at me very stern and seriously, she says, this word is not in the curriculum. <laughs> why is this word on the board <laughs> and to me that it epitomizes <laughs> like how ridiculous like mm. so we cannot use certain words right. you know I mean so anyway it was that year I cried so much Alvaro I, I came <laughs> home and as a matter of fact I quit at the end of the year I quit I could not fight this you know, like I said, 17 teachers against three was exhausting on me and uh, very emotionally. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it took everything I had, all the enthusiasm and the passion and me wanting to to really impact my students. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I quit and I, you know, for one year, I, I don't remember what I did. And then I was approached by a university who had heard about me. And that's how I went back to, to teaching. And uh, I had a couple more years with other schools that gave me a hard time. Mm -hmm. And eventually I decided to move to Denver uh, because Denver is really, uh, or was at the time when I moved in 2000, I don't remember, 10 or whatever, 13. Um, it was an oasis for, uh, 
for teachers. Um, CI. For, yeah, for CI teachers. Uh, you know, Susan Gross, so you've heard of Susan Gross, Susie Gross, mm -hmm. you know, started there. And so that I moved there and never regretted it. I've, my journey has been, you know, uh, I'm extremely fortunate that I teach there, I train teachers, I present, you know, in the United States as well as in France, you know, and I've been doing this for what, 10 years or mm -hmm. nine years and I look back and I can, I'm, I'm just extremely satisfied and happy. So you, you have total freedom to teach the way you want to? I have a hundred percent freedom, uh, Alvaro. It's amazing. So what happened is I started teaching in Denver and um, I inherited the first year, believe it or not. I don't know how it is in Poland in, in the schools, but I, I had 44, one of my classes had 44 students, imagine, 44, with desks. Mm. So I, um, it was very hard to do stories because there was no, I mean, I still did them, you know, but there was no movement, you know, we couldn't really, I, I had an actor in front of the class, but it was hard. Anyway, my principal came to observe me the, like two months into my first year there. And we were doing a story. I don't remember what the story was, but you know, there were some flowers, and the, the actor went and brought this flower to the principal. It completely spontaneous. There was no, you know, and she totally, she just could not believe this. So I, she was really like, she loved it. She loved the class. She loved the, everything, the atmosphere, the, you know, the. The, whatever was in the room and so I was like oh my god this is great so I went to see her and I and I asked her I said listen you see what I do in my classes we do a lot of stories and I you know there's a lot of movement and these desks they're in the way would you mind if I got rid of my desk and she said absolutely so I got rid of the desks okay. And, you know, and then there's been a movement now, people, because I, I, I do, I host a language lab, not just me, a, a, a few teachers in Denver, you, we call them master teacher, whatever, that's kind of silly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, uh, they come and observe us, uh, teachers from the district, as well as teachers from all over, they come and observe us. So I started this thing in Denver. Now, a lot of teachers get rid of their desk you know and uh, so it's great and so when we got rid of the desk my first uh, configuration was like a U you know mm -hmm. so I was there in the front and then the students were in a U the class just chairs okay mm -hmm. and uh, now I've changed it in the last few years couple of years we're all in a circle you know mm -hmm. And uh, the reason is I, I want to send a message that we, it's a whole, we're all part of the whole and we all contribute to this whole, okay? Mm -hmm. And yes, I'm the teacher, I have the language, but you all as important as me, we're all, you know, in this together and it's really been great. It's really been great. The kids have kind of, they're amazing. They're amazing. They're just like, they buy into it. They love it. Yeah. They love my class. They feel validated. They feel cared yeah. for. They feel human. You mm -hmm. know, with, with high schools, kids don't feel human. They feel like robots. Correct. <laughs> and in my class, they feel like human and they've told me so. And I think that you cannot teach until you get the buy-in. You know, you get the, 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 the students feel love, they feel secure, yeah. they, feel tr they trust you. You know, nothing can happen before you get that. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's just you're creating stories, you're having fun, you're, you're probably talking about topics that they're interested in. So yeah. no wonder they're, they're buying to the idea and 
And getting back to your principal, you know, it just she saw that they were having fun. She she probably saw that they were they could actually understand everything you were talking about. And it just yeah. It, like you said, that that what you said is important. Like make them feel human, right? Yeah. Like make them feel appreciated, not just robots listening to someone talk nonsense for an hour <laughs> just exactly. <kidding. laughs> exactly you know a lot of uh, a lot of even today you know a lot of uh, language teachers they still have that mentality of giving a lecture you mm. know i have i'm the vessel i have the language and yes of course i have the language but uh, it doesn't mean that you cannot communicate and you know, language, language, what is language for but communication, right? There's, unless you want to become a linguist and see how language, you know, works and how it's, it's put together, mm -hmm. unless you want to, and I tell my kids that, you know, I always explain, um, you know, language is used for communication and communication is not always words, right? Actually, a lot of communication is nonverbal. So that's why if you engage the student in a communicative event, they, they will respond maybe with a smile, you know, maybe with a thumbs up, or maybe they will answer in their own language. And that's okay, because that right. means they understood what you were saying. Right. And, you know, we have to, to, we have to model, we have to model good communication and of course I teach my kids that interpersonal communication which is a lot of what I do in my class you know interpersonal meaning between people between person um, has to do with being able to watch someone in the eyes that's why you know in CI we say you know we have to teach to the eyes and it's very true that you, the eyes are so important. And I teach my kids that. We do a lot of games in my class. When I say games, we have a lot of brain breaks, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, some of the brain breaks involve teaching how to become a better communicator, you know, how to look at yourself in the eyes. And it's very, very hard for, for teenagers, high schoolers. It's extremely hard. Yeah. <laughs> they're insecure and yeah, yeah they're so insecure they're so worried about the uh, you know other kids looking mm -hmm. at them and it's it's a very interesting age you know and yeah. uh, but yes yeah, so i i you know i want to teach them that language is only meant for communication and i have to I have to lead the way i have to really lead by example if you will uh -huh. so yeah yeah, and we, we know comprehensible input is all they need in order to learn the language, in order to acquire the language, excuse me, right? So what you said, whether they're they're responding to your questions or to your to your sentences with, with a smile or with a gesture or with, I don't know, with holding up a picture, whatever it is, that shows that they understood what you said. That's that's, and all, that's you all you need. That's all you need, you know. Uh, I... I present for the Bureau of Education and Research um, in the United States. So I, I go all over the country and I present on this, you know, I'm very passionate. So I want to spread the love, I want to spread the word. And uh, one of the things that I do at the beginning of my presentation, I, it's my presentations, the, fir the par first part of the morning, I talk a lot about the research, Krashen, BVP, mm -hmm. Van Patten, all these guys. And in the afternoon, I do demonstrations because I think you need to demo, yeah. you know. Uh, so that's how you pe people buy in, right? So, but I go and I'll ask a person, hey, what are you drinking, you know? And he or she will say, well, coffee. I said, wait a minute, you didn't, that's not what I want. I want a full sentence. I say, what are you drinking? And they say, coffee. I said, no, 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 give me a full sentence. And they laugh, I am drinking coffee. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, you see, you gave me a one word answer, right? You didn't give me a full sentence. Why would you expect your kids to do that? Why? Mm -hmm. You know, that's not communication. 
this is not how we communicate we use the the path of least resistance you know we are lazy humans and we're not gonna do that <laughs> so, and of course they laugh and and hopefully they yeah. get the message you know that that's not communication if you are going mm -hmm. to teach for communication you have to really right. uh be honest you know and uh, mm -hmm. uh, lead the way right so, yeah i think that 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 could come from uh, the traditional grammar approach idea that we need to practice in order to learn the language so because we think that way if i'm if i'm a student and i answer um i am drinking coffee as opposed to just coffee we think i'm actually practicing more so so i'm getting better which we all know you know doesn't work that way right? it doesn't work like that you know it probably comes from that yeah right those drills don't you yeah. know the language does not end up in your head because you're drilling mm -hmm. the language ends up in your head because you're engaged in 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 the in the communication in the communicative event and you are going to hear something and you're obviously you need to hear it more than once you know mm -hmm. but sometimes i tell you sometimes a word has such a powerful connection for a kid that they will remember you know yeah. somehow but yes they have to be engaged they have and they don't realize it's not about oh my god i'm learning a language it's i'm interested in what you have to say mm -hmm. we're engaged in this two-way conversation in in this uh, exchange of ideas and I'm I'm interested in what you have to say exactly. it's, it's the meaning it's not the form yeah. and when you do that and this is how babies acquire their mother tongue you know no mother is going to say please give me a full sentence <laughs> right? exactly. I'm, what mom does that you know exactly. uh, so yeah it's uh yeah, and that, that process always works, right? <laughs> it, it always works, and you get the buy you get the buy in because students realize that you're interested in them, and it's not about a hidden grammatical agenda that you have. You see, when you tell them that when you your message is, oh my God, I have a hidden agenda. It's not honest. It's not real. It's yeah. not so yeah yeah and so again with with the kids like if you're a mom you're not gonna tell you're not gonna think okay so today i'm gonna teach my kids present perfect or whatever it is right so i'm just gonna i'm just gonna use present perfect today <laughs> you know? exactly. exactly who does that you know who but if you really think about it look at the textbook you know they oh. teach you the present at least here in the united states the present is the first year the past mm -hmm. tense maybe you get to the past tense at the end of the first year and you know future is the third year maybe i don't know because i don't use i've never used textbooks so right. but you know i've seen textbooks so mm -hmm. it's ridiculous who does that you know who who yeah yeah you've probably, you've probably suffered through them as a student yourself right so. <laughs> yeah exactly exactly so i did but mm -hmm. yeah, yeah absolutely it's just it's just so so unnatural so artificial yeah. exactly so unnatural and so artificial you know another thing that i when i present i tell my my you know the teachers that are there the participants is you know when i first became a teacher i came in with all these ideas and these expectations because i didn't know right mm -hmm. and so in the, in the united states we have parent conferences so at the beginning of the year, like October, November, you know, we've had our students for a couple of months and we meet the parents. And so I would get the, the first year, you know, I would get the parents come to see me and they say, ah, oh, you're the French teacher. Great. I took French in high school <laughs> and I would get so excited, you know, and I start speaking French to them because I'm like, OK. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. I, I'm sorry. I can't. <laughs> <laughs> or they would just say a sentence that they, comment ça va, you know, or something, yeah. uh, but incapable. And so I tell the participant that now I never, never assume that they 
are able to use the French that they took mm. to communicate. So I go yeah. directly to English, okay? And uh, my, my mission in life is to change that. So I want my students uh, to one day will become parents, right? And they will go to their children's conferences and they will be able to, mm. you know, uh, maybe not fluently, but they'll be able to at least understand if the teacher speaks French to them. Right. And maybe, they, hopefully, they'll be able to uh, to say things and to communicate, even yeah. if imperfectly, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so that's, that's my passion and that's my job. That's my mission to mm -hmm. change that, you know, so that they are. And, you know, the funny thing is, as you know, as you know, Alvaro, that, you know, when you know, at the end of the school in June, you know, when the kids go home and they mm -hmm. are on vacation for two and a half months here in the United States, they come back to my class. I start speaking French to them. They won and they're a hundred percent. It's like nothing happened. It's like there was no interruption. Whereas because the French is in their head, you know, it's acquired. It's, right. it's wired in their brains. It's inside of their heads. And, you know, for those kids who have teachers in legacy traditional methods, they come back in August, September. They don't remember a thing. It's, no. If it's memorized, <laughs> they come back incapable. No, no, no. And, that always like, it's like, it's magic. They come back and it's like, nothing happened. We, it's like, we start wherever we left off, you know, they're able to, it's magic, Alvaro. It, it's magic. <laughs> I it, mean, yeah. and you know, being a mom, I know how it happens, you know, cause I had <laughs> kids, but to see it in your students, it's just like, like I say, it's really magic. It's like, oh my God. It's just, it's just the way we, we learn, right? <laughs> it's just the way we learn. It's just yeah. the way we acquire one, two, three languages. There's no yeah. other way. There's exactly. no other way. Yeah, and I, was, I was actually thinking about <clears throat> like my own study days. And it works for languages, but it works for pretty much anything. I, I, I remember just studying for history exam or whatever it was, just sort of spitting things out in the exam. And yes, you, you're talking about summer. I'd say a week later, I don't even know what it was. <laughs> <laughs> but it just, that's absolutely true. That's not that's, how we learn. It just, it doesn't yeah, make any sense. It doesn't. No. Yeah, it's so antiquated. And, but unfortunately, um, Alvaro, it's still, I mean, you know, we, we riding a wave, you know, and it's, a, it, it's positive, the changes that are happening. And I can tell you because, you know, like I say, I, I present and I see teachers all over the country that are hungry for something new. They're hungry mm -hmm. or they see that it doesn't work. And, you know, there's, less and less i mean there's still quite a few you know because the ones that come to my presentations are the ones that are actually interested in, right, right. in <laughs> changing their ways or at least listening to some other ways of teaching and there's a lot of other teachers who are not interested but at least the ones that i see i definitely because i've been doing this for like like i said many years and i see see the wave but it's still there's still a lot of you know it takes a while for change to actually happen you know yeah i mean it's so so the the traditional grammar approach is so dominant all over the world that it, it does take time but the good news is I, i'm sure there's a lot of teachers who started their careers using the traditional grammar approach because they didn't know otherwise right and you know they always have that feeling of I think something's wrong here, <laughs> but the, the good thing is 20, 25 years ago, you didn't really have the option to, I mean, you didn't have the internet basically. So right now, if you if you feel like something's wrong, you can go online and, and look for different ways or look for people who do it differently. And it's just so amazing, so wonderful. Because I guess 30 years ago, you, 
you you tried i mean you use the traditional grammar approach because that way you were taught and that's the only thing you knew and you really didn't have any other option to yeah to to learn new things or to learn a new way to do it which that's again right. it's not it's not a new way it's just the way we all acquire our native languages again right <laughs> exactly it's it's so like common sense that it escapes us like right things that are right in front of our eyes mm -hmm. we're just like looking like you know to the forest when you, you should be looking right here which yeah. but yeah you know i've had teachers uh alvaro i can remember a couple of instances uh where I had teachers who would come back after a presentation crying with tears, thanking me. And I remember this one teacher, she had been teaching for 30 years. And she, at the end of my presentation, she was in tears, she thanked me. And she said, I never thought that I would change. And I just realized that I've been like doing it wrong. And I, you know, of course I said, no, you haven't, you know, but I'm so happy that it's happening to you, even 30 years into you teaching. Right. So, yeah. It really takes a special person, perhaps. Uh, you really need to have a paradigm shift. Like I said, it's so obvious that we right. don't see it, you yeah. know. And also here in the United States, Alvaro, I don't know about you're in Poland and, and in Europe, but, oh God, I lost my train of thought. I don't know what I was going <laughs> to say. Worries. Yeah, it, it probably. Yeah, something about the paradigm shift that you were talking about or yeah. like changing after 30 years, something related yeah. to that? Or? Yeah, it's going to come back. I'm sorry. I, no worries. It escaped me. Yeah, yeah, I was just thinking that so to give you some time to think about it, <laughs> like I'm, I'm, I'm always criticizing the traditional grammar approach and the sort of the traditional formal education. But I, I always say like, this is not, I, I'm not talking about teachers. Like I'm talking about the system because I'm sure just like that woman that you talked about, I'm sure like a huge percentage of, of teachers, they just don't know uh, they they, they just don't think there's an alternative because you know through their own experience as students through their you know when when they went to college if they wanted to be teachers the way they were taught they had to teach <laughs> was the traditional grammar approach so they just they don't have any other in their head there's no other option so that's why you know I'm always criticizing the traditional grammar approach and, and you know formal education in that way but I, I, I want to say it again, like, I'm not, this is not an, a take on, on, this is not on teachers, right? It's on the system. It's yeah. on the system. And I remember what I wanted to say. Okay. Uh, here in the United States, you know, because language is not, you know, has not been important in the history, mm -hmm. you know, now, uh, uh, of course, you know, we have a, a growing Hispanic population in the United States, and that's wonderful. I, I think it's just the best thing that ever happened here. Uh, but, you know, there was that kind of isolation, you know, mm -hmm. you know, this is such a big place and we, we really don't need other languages. We can just, English is just enough, you know. Mm -hmm. And so, because languages have not been valued as an important asset, the language programs have not, you know, consequently been like, uh, I don't want to say important, but you will find a lot of uh, teachers who teach languages and they don't have a mass, they don't master the, the, the language themselves. So, yeah, right. you know, you can become a, a, a German teacher or French teacher or Chinese teacher and, and you don't even it's you know you're perhaps mm -hmm. at, at an intermediate level to use the actual um, mm -hmm. so and that's so they they probably you know to use this approach means that you are comfortable in the language right you you, you can use it oh, absolutely people. Absolutely. And so it's probably threatening, mm. you know, and I'm not saying all teachers, there's lots of 
absolutely wonderful teachers who master the language they're teaching, but there's also a lot of teachers who took that in high school and maybe university, but yeah. that's all, they didn't get the experience of being immersed in it. So they come and they teach it and they're, you know, they're not a hundred percent comfortable or not fluent. Mm -hmm. And so they probably feel threatened and teaching with a book is very reassuring because you know exactly what's in there Sorry. and there's no surprises. When you teach for communication, I don't know what my students are going to respond. I don't know, you know, I have a plan in my head, but it can take me to a place that I wasn't thinking of. And it doesn't mm -hmm. matter because if it's just communication again, yeah. you know, you, you, you focus on, on, on whatever it is that you're talking about, right? Yes, there are techniques. And yeah. I, I think that you need to have a good grasp on the techniques, you know, but the techniques is, I want to say, secondary yeah, yeah. To message, the, the communication act, you know. So it's probably, you know, for, for those teachers who, who are not 100% confident of their language skills, teaching with a book, Alvaro, is very reassuring because you know exactly what's coming. Yeah, yeah. You know, you don't have to venture out in... Yeah, it's scary, that, it's scary, yeah. yeah. It, it can be very scary. And I think First, that that's, yes. that's why we have this issue. So we need to right. change in here in the United States, at least the, it has to start with, uh, it has to start with the top, the universities, right? Because mm -hmm. even at the university and especially at the university, uh, they, it's, it's still product, um, a translation mm -hmm. method, you know, it's yeah. still very traditional grammar, you yeah. know, and uh, so it has to start from the bar from the yeah. top, but it also has to trickle down to the bottom. And uh, the teachers in in their methodology and in their training have yeah. to become better at mastering the language that they're going to teach, so that they they can um, you know teach for communication. Yeah, yeah. Even if they do master the language, it can still be scary, right? Because there's uncertainty involved and you have to improvise a lot of times and and we adults freak out when when there's uncertainty right <laughs> so, that's so true yeah. that is such a good point you know we are we are programmed it's you know in order to teach the way we do you have to be able to be vulnerable mm. so you know I do, like I'm sure you do as well, I do a lot of things, you know, in my class. So one of the things that I do is uh, called Star of the Week, which maybe you came to one of my presentation. But anyway, uh, I, I have a questionnaire. And by the way, the questionnaire is, uh, the questions are student generated, you know, because mm -hmm. it's, it's more interesting when the question comes from the students. Uh, so anyway, uh, I have a, a student volunteer who comes to the front of the class and we have an interview and I interview him or her with the questions. And um, Alvaro, I can remember times when, um, you know, some of the answers given my, by my students are so touching that, you know, it makes me cry. And uh, it took me a while, you know, the very first time that it happened. Actually, I could tell you the story because I remember the story. I had a student um, who came into my classroom and he was limping. Okay, he was limping. Uh, and uh, I just thought that he had, he was playing uh, soccer. And I just thought that he had been injured in a soccer mm. game or something like this. Yeah. And he happened to be the star of the week. Um, and so I asked him a question and the question was, uh, what is one thing you regret the most in your life? And, and he said, uh, the thing that I regret the, the most in my life was that, um, you know, I was born with polio. Mm in Congo and I, I, I didn't have surgery when I was a baby and uh, that's why I walk like this. 
And Alvaro, uh, I was just so touched that I had to turn and, and cry, you know, but I was embarrassed to cry, you mm -hmm. know. Now, it's okay. I'm not, if it <laughs> comes, I'm crying. I swear, sometimes I have like tears and my students are like, so, so emotional. And I'm like, I know I am, you know, <laughs> or, or the opposite, you know, sometimes I'm, you know, like I remember another uh, story like this, you know, it was with my adults because I teach adults. Um, and uh, this was when I was teaching at the University of uh, Colorado in Boulder. Uh, one of my adult students, I don't remember the question, but the answer was, I do a lot of immoral things. <laughs> and I had to turn and laugh, you know, and, uh, but now I will laugh like Nothing. loud in front of a class. And oh my God, we had so much fun after that, you know, so she became the Ooh, you're the immoral one. The <laughs> right. class, right? So that then you get these labels and it's all in good humor. It's all fun, you know. Yeah. Um, but that's that's you know, that's what happens. You have to be vulnerable, you yeah. have to be yeah. able to be a human to show up. And that's something that honestly, Alvaro, I maybe I wasn't at first, I didn't know how to do this, mm -hmm. you know because I thought I'm the teacher, I'm not supposed to cry, right, I'm right. supposed to laugh, I'm supposed right. to be here and, and show them, you know, but no, I'm here, I'm a human. And, and first and foremost, you know, and I think that that's what my students appreciate is the fact that I remain a human. <laughs> I remain yeah, you're just being honest and real. That's something we forget as adults, right? That's exactly right, you know, we and, are like, yeah. We have this mold, this idea, the teachers, you know, into this mold, but uh, no, yeah. you have to be human. And sometimes I get angry and I'm like, oh no, I, was, <laughs> I shouldn't have shown that side of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, right, right. Yeah, I mean, I don't have to deal with that as much because I only teach adults. But still, you know, if sometimes they just ask me something and I don't know. So it's okay to say, I don't know. <laughs> exactly. That's another thing. You know, at first, you know, when I first started to teach, I thought, and I'm a, I'm a French native. So, you know, but sometimes they ask me for a word, yeah, you yeah. know, like a name of an animal. And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know how you say that, yeah. you know, and yeah. at first I was like, oh my God, I didn't know that word. Look, they're going to think that I'm a bad teacher. <laughs> now I'm like, I don't know. Let me look it up, you know, and we look it up together. Exactly. Yeah, of course. It doesn't mean that, you know, you have all of it together, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's just, again, it's just, if you're being real, you're being honest, they're going to respect that. They're going to appreciate that. And that's right. Yeah, that's exactly and that's right. kids, adults, or whoever that is, because you know we all make mistakes. No one's perfect, and yeah, I, I like whatever the topic. Like I, I don't know if respect is a word, but whenever I'm just watching a video on YouTube or whatever it is I'm doing, on engaging with someone in the street, whatever it is. When the other person is real, it's honest. Just, it just, I just feel that level of connection that goes beyond anything that you can think of because that person is being real. You know, they're 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 showing vulnerability, like you said. So, you're right. It's it's all about that connection with another human being. Yeah. And uh, like I said, you know, you can't teach until you have that trust and you've made that connection. And I'm not saying that it's going to happen every single time with every, every one student, but when it does happen that you have that connection, mm -hmm. it's, it's lasting and it's, it produces, uh, you know, once they have you, they trust you and you trust them, the language is going to be, it's going to happen, yep. you know? Yeah, because like you said, it's it's all about communication and meaning that happens to be in the language you want to teach, right? The, the language is secondary. It will happen. Yeah. But you have to have that trust. You have to have built that community 
uh, with your students and no teaching will happen until that is there, um, Alvaro. Correct. That's why I said, uh, you know, I teach adults and with adults it's, it's easier, you know, because there's yeah. no classroom management, you know, but with, with kids, you know, even teenagers, uh, you, there's so much needs to happen before you're able to actually impact and the language is able yeah. to be acquired. You need, there's so much that, so that trust, that building community uh, is so, so important. It's important with adults too. Yeah, 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 absolutely. But, but adults want to be there. That's right. Yeah. That's right. The kids, they come to your classroom and I... So they're forced so, to. <laughs> yeah, I asked them, why are you here? Oh, my mom told me. My mom, my dad said, I, I have to teach. I have to take French, you know. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I do a survey at the end of uh, semester and year uh, with my students. Uh, and Alvaro, it's, I always get the same answers, you know. Um, like what helped you acquire the most? What helped you acquire the, the least? You know, how did you acquire French? And the answers are always there. You treated us like humans. You were interested in us. You repeated so many times. Mm. You were slow. Uh, you use pictures, the repetition. You know, it's always the same thing that, yeah. you know, the the students uh, tell me you just cared about us right <laughs> mm -hmm. which you care. sounds simple, we sound simple but <laughs> yeah you did you did but also you know that they talk about the techniques without knowing that they're talking about the techniques yeah. you repeated a lot you know mm -hmm. you 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 spoke slowly you enunciated you know the repetitions really helped mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. so it's it's like, like I said, it's magic. Yeah. It's almost magic, <laughs> but. Yeah. And yeah, I was thinking as, as well, like when, when you travel around the country with those presentations, you said that most people that go to those presentations are interested already, but do you have to do a lot of convincing? Because, you know, some, because that works for that scenario, but also in real life, you know, if you're talking about comprehensive input and you've got someone who tells you, nah, that's not going to work, or uh, you still need the grammar, or, you know, things of that nature. So, oh, of course. How do, how do you go about it? <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, you get pushback, uh, you get naysayers that are, but um, so, you know, I just, I think that the, for me, because I spend, it's usually these presentation are seven hours, you know, so I spent like two hours talking about the second language acquisition and the rest of five hours I do demonstrations. And so I do demonstration in French, obviously, mm -hmm. you know, so I think that for most people, um, the, demos, the demos really are eye-awakening, are like, mm -hmm. oh my God, I really understood. Right. This was like, I was like listening to you and it was like, oh my God. So demonstration, demos are really important. And yes, once in a while I'll get, uh, you know, a person that will not be fully convinced. Um, but I have to say, Alvaro, that it's happening less and less. And maybe because, like I said, we're in a wave and, mm -hmm. you know, even if you don't, are not interested, chances are you are going to have heard about maybe acquisition-driven instructions or CI, comprehensible input, whatever acronym we want to use. Yeah. Chances are that you are going to have heard about that and so at least you have a little bit of curiosity. Yes, you're not gonna, you're not gonna be able to reach 100% of your audience. But okay. I have to say that over the years that I've been presenting, it's less and less. Okay. So it's really encouraging. But of course, 
they are there's always going to be a teacher an adult who's like not receptive yeah and uh maybe they will never be receptive like i i think that it takes a person that is open-minded enough you know that is willing to say hey you know maybe i i was wrong and, and i'm not saying it's wrong or right i don't want to put it into these many key and terms but you know oh maybe there's another way you know maybe just curiosity just uh be open-minded you know yeah yeah but i guess the, the demos like you said are really important because you you get to feel what a student feels right? that's it yeah you have i mean i'm sure you alvaro going to Agen, the the conference mm -hmm. in france you probably put yourself made yourself go to a chinese class maybe or i know you were in my class um or you know another language uh, that was offered there and there's nothing like it you know you have to be in the shoe of a student you have to experience it to uh, to understand it and when i say understand it it doesn't mean understand it on an intellectual level but understand it almost in like a emotional or yeah, to feel it. Yeah. you have to feel it you have to oh my god what did she say what did he say and really be like oh i really want to you know you have to be really interested and yeah i was and, in your french lab but i also attended one of diane's chinese classes and some other languages so yeah yeah absolutely it just because back then I didn't have any experience either. So that was really what helped me realize, okay, so this is the way to do it. Because this is what I'm feeling as a student, as a student. So this is what I need to do as a teacher myself, right? Because that's that's what I needed when I was the student. So that's what my students are going to need, right? So yeah, there's a, you know, I would say there's a humility. You know, you become mm -hmm. humble. Yep. humbled by you know especially if you go in a language that is so different than your own because obviously speaking spanish if you're going to go in a french class you're gonna there's going it, mind you it's very different but still there's gonna be there's gonna be some commonality yeah you, you can know? figure a little bit uh, yeah. yeah you can figure a little bit but when you go to a language that is completely different than yours you i don't know for me it was very humbling you yeah. know and i was like oh my god i i have to understand that my students are going to feel like scared and and uh, lost and yeah you know oh my god you 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 it, honestly it just it it opens a complete different mindset you know that that you have to be patient and that you have to really repeat and that you really have to speak slowly enunciate all of these things but you know something very interesting Alvaro that's happening so you know last year of course with COVID I taught remotely mm -hmm. the entire year I was teaching not on Zoom but you know on Google Meets which is mm -hmm. Mm -hmm the same kind of things yeah. so I had my students behind the screen obviously uh, this year it's uh, I go and I'm teaching with a mask you know and I was very nervous at first because I was thinking you know my student need to see me you know need to see my lips mm -hmm. when I say words so they you know it really helps that helps yeah but you know what, Alvaro, this was a learning experience. I just realized that no, they, you know, it's not, not so much about, it is a little bit of that and it helps, I'm sure, but I'm behind a mask and I'm still talking, you know, and they still acquiring. Yeah. So that was really something that surprised me a lot. I thought they really need to see this. Yeah. Uh, but no. And you know, it's like the difference between a podcast, like what you're doing right now, where the people will be able to see us interacting versus a podcast where you just listen, you know, and there's no 
cues, you know, facial yeah, they, cues. They might be listening on Spotify as well, but it's on YouTube as well. So. <laughs> oh, okay, okay. So, you know, yeah, but in true. fact, the listening is, is an exercise that takes practice in the fact that the more you listen, the easier it becomes, right? But I was surprised, you know, that the I was very nervous. Oh, this is going to impede. It's going to hinder, you know. Uh, but no, no, it's not really there. I'm talking behind a mask and they still are understanding and they're still acquiring, you know. Yeah, I guess when you don't have that to sort of help you out, you focus on other ways that you other things you can use in order to provide comprehensible input, which is the key again, right? Uh, I've noticed that with podcasts, now that you mentioned that, like as a language learner myself, I was reluctant to use podcasts to learn because of the lack of the visual help, right? But I realized that probably subconsciously, people when, when creating a podcast, because they know uh, listeners are not going to be able to see what they're talking about, they tend to slow down a little bit and, and speak in a clear way. So, uh, you know, I've, I've, talk, I've talked about the power of podcasts because of it, because it's more comprehensible than I thought because of that. That's true. That is very true. You know, we use, uh, it's like, you know, people who can't see, you know, they rely on other senses, you sure. know. And uh, you're absolutely right, you know. And as I'm telling you this thing about masks, I'm thinking, you know, it's funny now that everybody's wearing masks. You think, okay, so the mask covers your nose and your mouth, so you can't really see people's expression. You don't know. Mm -hmm. But have you noticed how, even though we're wearing masks, we still see people smiling? Yeah. <laughs> and the smile is not yeah, just in the out, mouth, it's yeah, also in the out. eyes. Yeah. So even though they don't see my mouth, they probably still see my eyes and my eyebrows. And I'm very, you know, people always tell me, oh my God, so much of what you say happens in your facial expression. Mm -hmm. So I guess the eyes are also very important. Yeah. 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 So in, yeah, like I said, in the end, you you need to provide comprehensible input. That's that's the most important thing. And if, if you can't rely on your mouth because it's covered, just, yeah. You, I mean, there's so much more. There's the tone that you use, you know, there's uh, not just, uh, yeah, you even, know, it's not verbal, it's- Even it's without you realizing it, yeah. You're gonna do it. Okay, so. So you you say you're teaching adults as well. So do you teach life only or also? So, yeah, I started teaching uh, through the University of Colorado Boulder. And um, I did this for about five years. And then I opened my own business, which <laughs> French Rev. French Rev. Um, so we, so there's three of us. Um, there's Mark Knowles, um, Mark, uh, was um, he actually hired me uh, at Boulder and he is a doctor in second language uh, acquisition as well as French. And there's also Elisabeth Deniso. She was also a, a French educator. And so the three of us, we opened this, um, this French Rev. And so we teach adults online now. And we also do podcasts like you do, but the podcasts are geared for learners. Okay, okay. it's not about how we acquire it. So we have um, podcasts for novices as well as intermediate and advanced. So for people who want to acquire French, um, we offer those and those are, uh, it's mostly Elizabeth and I, Mark is also there doing a lot of the tech things. And he's also, you know, the the linguist, and he, he teaches us a lot as well. Uh, but most of the podcast, it's Elizabeth and I interacting, talking about, about different things. And uh, so learners can listen to our, in, nice. to our podcast and, and acquire French. But is it only audio or is- No, it's video, it's video, video. as well. Yeah, it's video, like-, like mm -hmm. So you can use images and gestures and- mm -hmm. So Everything that we were talking about, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, so if 
if some of your uh, listeners are interested, it, I'll put a plug here. <laughs> it's, it's frenchrev.org. Okay, if you go to frenchrev.org, that takes you to our uh, website, and then it'll, there will be a link to our uh, YouTube channel where we have okay. over a hundred. 100 episodes for yeah I'll, um, I'll, I'll, leave, I'll leave the link below as well oh thank you thank you so much yes yeah, so for and it's free of course you know um awesome. and novice intermediate and advanced can awesome. listen to mm-hmm. french yeah so we that's what i've been doing for the last couple of years perfect so you yep. tell stories and you interact with each other. And, yeah, and- we interact with each other and we we being goofy, you know, because <laughs> being goofy is part of, you know, what we do when we teach using this. We have to make fun of ourselves and... Uh, Always good. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> cool. Yeah, so I'll leave, I'll leave the link to the website and the YouTube channel. Thank you. Um, well, if there's any other platform that you use, you can yeah, you can let me know as well. And yeah, I'll, I'll thank you. Me. And and Alvaro, thank you for doing this. This is absolutely needed. Um, and uh, yeah, I can't think of a better way to spread the word uh, to people that really be open-minded to other ways of teaching and this way and I hate to say way this approach if you will will definitely lead uh, to results that you were not expecting so absolutely yeah I'm super passionate first of all about languages and I'm just having so much fun because yeah like the main idea is to bring more awareness into this idea and to spread the world like you said but also even for people who are already convinced that this is the way to, to acquire a language, you know, from different conversations with different people, we agree on the main thing, but we all have different little ideas or little sources of comprehensible input, if you will, that we use in our classes or as language learners ourselves, right? So in every single conversation, I'm, I'm learning myself about new things uh, new ideas and so yeah i'm so, so much fun with it <laughs> i agree we all continue learning you know it's it's not a, a process that has an end to it i'm learning every single day and i'm glad that you said that it's really it, i guess it's what they call here like the growth mindset you know we never stop learning so you're right i'm learning from teachers who do this on a daily basis and i'm always like oh, this is great, what a great idea. We learn from one another. It's very, very important to have that um, approach, you know. And how about you as a language learner? Are you learning any language now or? So, my goodness, uh, Alvaro. So I'm trying desperately to take Hebrew using CI. And I I have found a teacher. We haven't started yet, but it's definitely in the works. And you know what else I'm doing? I told you that I'm uh, I was raised by a Spanish speaking nanny, so I'm listening to um, a series on Netflix and Hulu uh, with other languages. So I speak Italian, I speak Spanish, and to keep up with my languages, that's what I do right now. I'm I don't know if you know this. <laughs> It's kind of a soap opera, I'm a little embarrassed to say, but I'm watching Velvet. Uh huh. Velvet. Oh, and I, my Spanish is coming back, like, you know, the good and the bad Spanish. <laughs> so that's how I'm, yes, I keep up with my languages right now. Uh, for lack of getting a CI teacher I can interact right. with, you know, by listening to, and I highly encourage people, uh, you know, people who want to acquire another language to do that, you know, so I, I watch a lot of uh, a lot of movies and series in other languages. Yeah, you just need to keep getting comprehensible input. Right? That's right. You just need to hear it. Yeah, and the good thing is once you get to a sort of intermediate point, I mean, it depends on the language, of course, how similar it is to your native language. But once you get to a point in which you can understand, uh, let alone series, but resources on your own, let's put it that way, 
it's all about just spending some time every day. That's what I do as well. Like it is, and that's what I say. You know, Alvaro, I haven't it's said fun. that. It's fun. <laughs> yeah, it's right. fun, but you know what? You have to be. You have to be realistic. It mm -hmm. takes time. Oh, me. You know, you have to. For adult student who come and they say, "I want to speak French," yes, you're going to, but you, it's going to. It's it's. You have to be willing to accept that this is not a miracle that is going to happen overnight. Exactly. It depends on how much time you're going to devote yourself to it, you know? Mm -hmm. And it's not just my class. My class hopefully will be a way to make you like the music of the language and, and, and have an emotional connection with the language, but you are going to, your work is going to have to be to want to listen to more of the language and read, of course, read is so important in acquisition. So you have, it's, the, it's no miracle cure. You need time. Just like, you know, if you think about it, kids who become fluent, it's after, let's say, I think it's 15,600 hours Five, let's say five years, at five years, a kid is able to really uh, uh, express himself or herself fluently, but it's eight hours a day, let's say, more or less, you know, times 365 days a year times five. I think it's 15,600 hours. So compare that with the number of hours that you're going to have in the language with a teacher, you need to supplement that with other things. You know, you need yeah, to yeah. either go, if you're lucky enough to go to a country where that language is spoken, or now that we have the internet and all these things available to us. So you have to be patient with yourself. I'm sorry, I'm speaking. No, so no, much. absolutely, absolutely. It's just, no, no, I think it's important to mention that. Please. But uh, teachers have to realize when I present, I say, look, how many hours do you have with your students? I have maybe 100 hours a year. So if I'm lucky to have my student for four years, that's going to be 400 hours. Compare that. And the moment they leave your classroom, they're not going to hear French. OK, unless they go on podcasts, unless they go. So compare that with that of a native speaker who heard 15,600 hours until they were able to fluently communicate. So you have to be realistic. And you can make these kinds of comparison, Alvaro. Yeah. And yeah. then. When it comes to kids and the native language, you'd have to analyze how much of it is comprehensible, right? But yeah, yes. Yeah, of course, of course. Apples and oranges, but still important to make that comparison. Yeah, absolutely. And and to absolutely. give the teachers the the credit they deserve. You're not miracle workers. You're not gonna, you know, your kids are not gonna become fluent. Uh, just by with your class, you know, yes, some may pick up faster. We all acquire the different pace, but, yeah. you know, they're going to need to supplement and they're going to need to immerse themselves some other ways, lack of, for lack of going to a country where that language is spoken, you know. Yeah, exactly. If you, if you start watching things in, in that's French, what I do. For, I, yeah. for half an hour a day, that's going to yeah. the process because yeah. it's, it's more comprehensible input on a daily basis. Right? That's yeah. right. That's right. So, and we're so lucky we have great uh, series now on Netflix, you know, I've listened to Turkish, I've listened to Russian, you know, which I'm familiar with. And like I said, Italian, Spanish, I'm just like in heaven. It's heaven now. This is uh -huh. like the years we're in, Alvaro is fantastic. Like you can hear other languages without going to the country. Yeah, internet so. is, is just a wonder. Like, yeah. I mean, I, I won't get tired of repeating that. It's just, yeah. <laughs> it's life changing. Exactly. All right. So it was, it was wonderful, Sabrina. Oh, well, thank you for having me. It was wonderful to talk to you, see you again, you know, yeah. for lack of seeing you in person. Hope I will see you in Agen soon. I'll be there this summer. Hopefully, maybe you will or not. I don't know. We'll see. So, you, uh, you, I mean, did it happen last year live? So last year it happened. Yeah, I didn't want to go because of COVID. But this year it's happening again and I, I'm going. So, so I will so Like 2020 was online and last year, I mean, it's still 2021. As, right, it as was. recording this. <laughs> yeah. It happened live, you know, but I think it was on a much smaller scale because a lot of people did not want to go. But this year it's going to be live again. Okay. So I'm committed to go. Hopefully, you know, it will nothing drastic will happen with another variant or something. But mm -hmm. yeah, I'm, I will be there this summer. 
yeah, I'm, I'm going to have Judith uh, soon, so I, I'll ask her. <laughs> okay, great, great, <laughs> fantastic. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, thank you very much again, Sabrina. It was wonderful. Thank and you. A thank lot you. of interesting topics. Yeah, thank you for having me and looking forward to talking to you soon again. Yeah, and, you know, everyone listening to this, just any question, whatever, just let us know and... I'll leave the I'll leave the links to to Sabrina's pro, uh, project, like I said. So you know, go check it out. Uh, I'm sure it's wonderful. I'm gonna do it myself. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, thank you, Sabrina. Bye bye.